All right. Welcome, everyone. My name is Lyndia Hayden. I work in the Office for Diversity and Inclusion, also known as ODI. I am the co-lead with Pamela Abner of the Black Women Leaders Connect Employee Resource, Resource Group. This group was formed in November 2020. It is a collective of executive and senior level Black women administrative leaders with an established track record of management success. We are joined to support one another and to nurture and guide women within our health system and our communities. We are excited about today's event, which is in honor of Women's History Month. We will record and share this event on ODI's YouTube playlist if you want to share with others. The Black Women Leaders Connect plans to hold quarterly events in the future. If you want to know more about the group, its members, and future events, we will share the website in the chat area. It is my pleasure to introduce you to Maxine Legal, the moderator for today's event, Owning Your Career. If you have attended other events moderated by Maxine, you will not be disappointed. Enjoy. Thank you so much, Lindia. I really appreciate it. Um, before you disappear, I want to keep you on the screen. I just want to let everyone know it has been a true pleasure planning this event with Lindia. Uh, uh, we had this idea at one of our uh, Black Women ERG meetings maybe about two months ago, and I, I threw the idea out and Lindia took it and she ran with it. And uh, she was instrumental in selecting the awesome uh, panelists that we have for today. So, Lindia, thank you so much. It's been great. Thank working. you. You're welcome. My wow. pleasure. I look forward to doing more of these. I mean, ladies, are you excited? Are you? <laughs> I see some excitement there. You know, this is the first <laughs> of many that I hope that we'll begin to see. All right. So, Lindia welcomed you guys, but I have to do it again. Happy Friday. All right. This is a great way, in my opinion, to end the week. I want to welcome you to our first ever Black Women Leaders Connect ERG panel discussion. And we're doing this, yes, absolutely, in celebration of women's day. And why do we do this? Because as always, we need to engage, we need to encourage, we need to empower women at Mount Sinai, uh, Mount Sinai Health System, women in New York City, women across the country, women around the world. And that's exactly what we're aiming to do today. So again, I'm the Director of Patient Experience and Cultural Transformation at Mount Sinai Morningside, and I'm also your moderator for this awesome discussion. Um, so we are talking about owning your career. And, and what does that even, what does that even mean? Well, we're gonna answer the question. We're gonna answer the question today because of the extraordinary list of panelists that we have. So I'm gonna introduce them one by one. Ladies, when you hear your name, just give a wave. All right, so let people know. So I'm gonna start off with Kalandra Branch. Hey Kalandra, how you doing? All right. Hey, good. Let me show you a little bit about Calandra. She's a career mentor and public speaker on leadership and patient-centered care. Um, she's a certified John C. Maxwell leadership coach, trainer, and speaker. She holds an MBA in health and hospital management and is a fellow of the American College of Healthcare Executives, as well as a member of Healthcare Leaders of New York and the National Association of Health Services Executives. Now, like she has, but Calandra has 30 years of experience. That means that she started very, very, very <coughs> All right. All right. Three years of experience in healthcare, including responsibility for creating and executing short and long term strategic financial and technological objectives. She served in clinical operations, finance and project management for 26 years at New York Presbyterian. So she's currently the deputy director of behavioral health at Mount Sinai Beth Israel. She has oversight in administrative and fiscal operations for the Department of Psychiatry. Um, and her leadership philosophy is this. I don't seek status but instead strive to have a story to tell. Status impresses, but a story inspires. I love that, Calandra. She goes on to say, I'd rather inspire someone to create their own su success than just impress them with mine. So welcome, Calandra, it's great to have you. Thank you, good to be here, Maxine. All right, wonderful. The next person I'm gonna introduce is Tremaine Cunningham. Tremaine, give us a wave. All right. Tremaine Cunningham is the System Vice Chair of Administrative and Finance for the Brookdale Department of Geriatrics and Palliative Medicine. And once again, over 30 years of experience. I wanna make it very clear. These ladies started very young. All right, over 30 years of experience in healthcare administration. In partnership with the system chair, she's responsible for administrative clinical research, academic, financial, and strategic initiatives across the system. Tremaine joined Mount Sinai in 1996, 
as a medical secretary with the Department of Pediatrics, where she worked her way up the ranks. In 2000, 2006, she became the director of operations focusing on process improvement for ambulatory services. Um, and listen to this. She was successful in improving clinical revenue, patient access, skills retention, space utilization, and just to throw that in for fun, also patient satisfaction. That is wonderful. Over the years, Tremaine has mentored many young women who have gone on to become successful leaders at Mount Sinai. Her professors include improving diversity, equity, and inclusion in healthcare. And she's currently collaborating with Girls Inc. of Long Island, the pathway for girls age 18, 11 to 18 in healthcare. So welcome. Great to have you. Thank you for inviting me. The next panelist I'd like to introduce is Dr. Lisa Island. Dr. Island's path was not straightforward. When she graduated college, she embarked on an investment banking career. Soon after, she realized she wanted a career that more personally impacted people's lives. She went to medical school and eventually completed a pediatric residency and neonatal fellowship. In 2011, she joined Mount Sinai. In 2015, she became the director of the NICU. She strives to equip families and staff with tools to minimize stress and optimize outcome of vulnerable newborns. Outside of her clinical responsibilities, she chairs the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee for her local American Academy of Pediatrics chapter. She co-directs a summer healthcare internship for underrepresented high school students, and she chairs the ISSM Promotions Committee. She also chairs the Mount Sinai West and Mount Sinai Morningside Medical Records Committee and serves on very community and hospital communities as well. So welcome, Dr. Island. It's great to have you with us this morning. Thank All you. Right. It's great being here. Wonderful. And last but not least, I want to introduce Dr. Luanza Harris. Dr. Luanza Harris is the Vice President of Quality and Regulatory Affairs for the Mount Sinai Health System. Now, quite recently, she joined in January of 2021. Dr. Harris provides strategic leadership and oversight for all clinical quality functions across the health system to achieve organizational goals related to clinical excellence, regulatory compliance, and quality management. A highly respected physician leader, Dr. Harris has more than 10 years of experience driving system-wide improvements in risk management, quality safety, and regulatory affairs. She's led several successful initiatives in team training, clinical risk management, readmission, regulatory compliance, and infection prevention. Most recently, she was the Associate, Chair, Associate Chief Quality Officer for New York Presbyterian. She's a board certified family physician. She received her MD and MPH from the University of Rochester School of Medicine and Dentistry. And she is the 2022 Executive MBA MS in Healthcare Leadership candidate at SC Johnson College of Business at Cornell University and Wild Cornell Graduate School. Welcome, Dr. Harris. Great to have you with us. All right. All right. So I think we've talked a lot about your accomplishments, and they are impressive, uh, extremely impressive. But sometimes it's also helpful to get to know people on a personal level. So I'm going to have a little fun with you guys, if it's okay with you. I want to take a moment for you guys to share one fun fact about you, something we wouldn't know if we saw Kalandra walking down the hallway, all right? Something we might not know if we saw Tremaine in the elevator that you're just dying to share with our audience today. So guess what? Because I came up with the idea, I'll start. Something you may not know about Maxine if you saw her walking down the hallway. I am a music enthusiast. I love music. I can't get enough, all right? I, I grew up on hip hop. Then I switched over to gospel because I don't know what they're talking about now, okay? And I sing. I play a little piano, not too much. I need to get back into that. Um, I have two girls and I'm actually, I've actually been teaching them how to sing harmony. So watch out world, all right? Because you never know what could happen in the next several years. But that's a little about me personally. Who would like to jump in first and share a little bit about themselves? Little fun fact, anyone? Anyone? Well, I'm gonna jump in because I'm actually piggyback, piggybacking off of yours. I actually am also a music enthusiast. I have a blog uh, called uh, Liner Notes Lounge, and I also do a music podcast called The Listening Suite. So that's my fun fact, although I haven't had much time to devote to it in the last year or so, but it's something I do like to do off this, on the side. Wonderful. And Kalandra, did you mention what is your, what is your favorite genre of music? Did I hear you say that? Or maybe I not? like it all, but my favorite genre is jazz. If I were on an island with only one genre of music, it would be jazz. Mm, awesome. Excellent. Thank you so much, Kalandra. Anyone else? Well, since we're 
on the musical theme. <laughs> I am the karaoke queen. <laughs> Man. I have an award and a golden mic to prove it. Um, so um, some of you might know, um, but if you were just hired, let's say in the last three to four years, and you've seen the New Beginnings video for Wayfinding, that's actually me singing. The Walk This Way song, that's me. That was excellent. <laughs> I look a lot different, but yeah, so that's one fun fact. I love yeah. Carrie and singing. I love it. I love it. Thank you, Jermaine. That was actually a great video. And yes, you can sing. <laughs> Thank you for that. All right, wonderful. Uh, Dr. Harris, can I go to you? Yeah, yeah, I was just about to jump in. So a fun fact for me, it's, it's, it's the same thing along music. Um, growing up, um, in addition to loving medicine, I loved singing. So um, I was a part of a group. I did a lot of singing growing up, classical music, as well as singing mm -hmm. jazz and R&B. Um, I decided since I love science that I would, you know, I wanted to become a doctor. Um, but my intention was to go back to singing, but little did I know it would take this long. But so whenever I see someone on stage, I, that's the only time I get envious because, you know, for those who know me, I love to entertain. And, um, you know, I, that's one of the things that, that, I, that I definitely miss is being able to get on a stage and sing. So um, that's a fun fact about me. Awesome, wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Harris. Um, Dr. Island, no pressure if it's not music. Okay, no. Unfortunately, sure. unlike my talented um, panelists, I have no musical ta talents. In fact, I'm tone deaf. So I love music, but please don't ask me to sing. So I pride myself on keeping calm and quiet. And I do that in two ways. One, um, I'm proud to say that um, I'm a meditator. So I have spent 1385 consecutive um, days meditating on Headspace. And the other way that I keep my calm and quiet is working out. So I hold the record of number of pull-ups um, that can be done in this household. So look out, I'm strong, but quiet. Oh, wow. Thank you so much. Ladies, thank you for just uh, doing that for me. I really appreciate it. And the chat is definitely alive with uh, a lot of people commenting and hearing all the awesome things you guys like to do in your free your free time. So uh, Tremaine, you're getting a shout out for your awesome karaoke skills, <laughs> right? Um, music is a theme. Someone wants us to start a group. Did I see that somewhere in here? I thought I saw that somewhere in here. So why don't we jump right into it? Um, I, I wanna start around career growth and development. I stole this quote from Mendia, um, who got it from Shirley Chisholm, who's quoted as saying, if they don't give you a seat at the table, bring a folding chair, all right? And I think that that's what you ladies have uh, done today. So first question, what are some of the things you've done that you feel have contributed to your career growth and development? And it's for anyone. I have a few targeted questions, but we'll open it up with that question to start. And I'll say it again. What are some of the things you've done that you feel have contributed to your career growth and development? You know, I, I would say for me, the number, one, the number one thing that I've done is to be intentional. I think you have to be very intentional about your career. And what I mean by that is you have to be very strategic and have a vision for yourself of what it is that you want to accomplish. You know, one of my greatest mentors that I've ever had, and I've had a lot of mentorship as well, and I would think to say that that was another thing, but one of the things that he said to me was, that no one will advocate for you the way you will. And that is the truth because people come with a, their different agendas. Even if they think that you are very talented, that you are a high performer, they still have certain goals that they want you to accomplish. But at the same time, you have your own goals and you have to let people know what it is that you want. And you have to be willing to put yourself out there. And so you have to be intentional. And that means having a discussion with, with people in terms of what those goals are. And being open to new opportunities that may come up. Not every move you make is going to be a promotion. It may be a lateral move. But if you do have a lateral move, it needs to add value 
to your portfolio. If you were to think about your skill set as a portfolio of things that you need to make sure that you have those projects that 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 feed into that, you need to make sure that it that if it is a lateral move, it's adding value to, to that. And if it's not, then you need to think about, well, it's time for me to take a leap. And you know, as the old saying is, no risk, no reward. So I think it's important to be very intentional. And number two, to have really solid mentors who surround you. Intentionality and mentorship. Thank you so much, Dr. Harris. Anyone else? Yeah, so piggybacking on what Dr. Harris said, certainly intentionality is extremely important. But one of the things that I've learned, um, particularly given my circuitous path to where I am, is that being open to change and keeping an open mind um, to what opportunity actually means. It may not be what you woke up that morning thinking, hey, this is something I'd like to do. But um, I've learned to try and take from whatever new situation or challenge that I face a lesson that's going to get me to the next level and what the next level means to each one of us is very personal. Um, but I think just being open to um, things that you might not have planned um, that are put in your path and, and using those to get where you'd like to be. Wonderful, anyone else? I always share with my, my mentees that um, you have to be agile. I mean, that's one of the basic tenets of good leadership is agility. And, you know, you can have a plan A and a plan B. And I think that sometimes we're kind of programmed as young people that you, you know, you need to stick with it and you need to do this, make up your mind to do what you're going to do. And then you need to do it. And then you need to do it in the same place for 25, 30 years, get your gold watch and retire. And that has changed so much. One of my mentors said to me that careers are no longer ladders, but that they're jungle gyms. And so you do have to move from side to side uh, in, in, in lateral progression. But as long as your trend line is going in a forward thinking direction, as Dr. Harris said, and that, that means that you have to, and it, it goes back to the, the, uh, the theme for today, it goes back to managing your career and not letting your career manage you. Thank you so much. Um, Shireen, did you want to jump in? Um, I'll just add one of the things I, and you know, I teach my daughters this, is to be bold and audacious um, in everything that you do. And in my career, I've had to be bold, fearless. You know, as opportunities come to us, sometimes I think as black women, and if you're a single mother, we are risk adverse. We don't like to take big chances because we have so much on our shoulders. Um, so being bold and fearless and um, stepping out on faith and believing in yourself are, um, pretty much what has carried me and allowed me to elevate over the years. Beautiful, thank you so much. You know, I was looking at the Q&A, a couple of you guys mentioned mentorship. Uh, the question in the Q&A was, oh, where's the best place to look for mentors? You know, I, I would say you look for mentors in every space. Mm -hmm. And um, I've never limited myself to just who's in front of me or who's at my organization. Um, to Tremaine's point, I am bold, I am fearless, and I will cold email someone who I do not know whatsoever, and I just happen to read an article about them or I saw something and I'll reach out to them. You know, but you know, if, if you do throw that, that line out and someone catches, mm -hmm. that's the person who you want to mentor you versus those who don't. And I think people show themselves in their actions, but you, you should, again, that's advocating for yourself. That's being intentional. That's managing your career. It's saying that I recognize that I need some guidance on what I, I'm thinking about. And I need someone to talk to, to bounce it off of. Very different than sponsorship. And I hope we do talk about sponsorship today, but you know, it's important to have those mentors and mentors could be temporary, they could be seasonal, they could be a lifetime. And, but you have to recognize the difference and, it, and it's also bi-directional as well. So don't be afraid to reach out. And, um, you, you know, if you see someone that you wanna learn from, you wanna, you know, chat with, 
send them an email. Can we go a little deeper into what you mentioned um, in regards to mentorship versus sponsorship? You said you want to talk a little bit about it. Do you mind if we can? Can you can you can you kind sure. of the the difference between the two? Sure, sure. So a mentor is someone who provides guidance, like everyday guidance. If there is something that you are encountering and you want to bounce it off of, of them, if there's a situation and you want guidance on, well, how do I handle this? Um, what would you recommend? They're basically there to keep you from reinventing the wheel. They're a great listener. Mm -hmm. um, a sponsor is someone who is in a senior position, mm -hmm. who, who actually, who is at the table where decisions are being made, who can open the door for you, who can create opportunities for you. And if you look at it statistically, it tends not to be people who look like us. Um, and I will say I've been fortunate to have had mentors and sponsors in my career. And there is a difference. And the, the thing is, how do we make sure that we get in the positions that we are, that we can sponsor people? Because when you're not in the room, that person who is your sponsor will mention your name and say, hey, I think Tremaine is a great person for this opportunity. They're a sponsor. They're senior enough to be able to do so. That's different from a mentor. A mentor can still be a senior executive, but it's just the difference between that relationship. And usually we do not have as much access to a sponsor as, and, you know, more so than mentors. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Calandra, I see you nodding your head. You um, I, I, I did not learn that difference until a few years ago. Yeah. And uh, I was having a conversation with a colleague and she recommended the book. And I, I apologize, I'm going to botch the title, but basically it was saying, don't just look for a mentor, look for a sponsor. And so I started to do my own research about that difference between a mentor and a sponsor. And sponsorship is really interesting because not only is it providing an opportunity, but it's really that leader putting themselves on the line and being willing and open to you know, put your name out there at the table because there's a lot of people who don't mind giving you advice, but there's mm -hmm. not as many people who are willing or even, even if they're able, who are willing to put your name out there in the street because mm -hmm. then you become competition. And so in some, in some ways, and we do have people unfortunately who are like that. So my personal goal is to be more of a, of a sponsor to people. Um, it's, it's really significant. And as Dr. Harris said, there are different levels of mentorship. I'm actually learning that myself in that it's not always just one person that you're, you're looking at or one person in a particular field, but actually it's encouraged to find mentors and allies outside of your field. Maybe it's okay to have a mentor who is a man, a mentor who is not African American, because you have a cadre of people to reach out to, because you need to get insights from other people. As Dr. Harris said, we're taking ownership. We need to take ownership of our mentoring as well. It's the mentee that really drives the relationship because you have to come to that relationship knowing what you want. The mentor is not there to tell you what to do, how to do it, and when to do it, to give you the roadmap. Your job as the mentee is to say, this is what I want, and your mentor and your sponsor will help you navigate those waters. So it's important for us to realize that mentor, being a mentee is just as much of an active role as being a mentor, and again, it's about you knowing what you want and taking control and managing your, your, your own career and managing yourself. Wonderful. Thank you so much. They're asking for the title of the book again in the chat. Uh, so I'll on. find it. I'll find time. it. <laughs> all right. No pressure. But if you can, a minute you drop a book name, people are all over that. I know. I know. <laughs> and, there's <laughs> a great, sign on. and there's a great video by Carla Harris that talks about sponsorship as Ooh. well. I think um, that um, Dr. Nolan Kajetsu dropped the link in the chat, I believe. Okay, great. Yeah, she, she talks a lot ab about that and um, her experiences. Uh, Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you for defining that. That is great insight. Um, Dr. Harris, I want to come back to you. I know that we're talking about career growth and development. So I know you recently joined Mount Sinai Health System just earlier, earlier this year. Um, how have, you know, the things that you've done, you mentioned intention, I think it was you who mentioned intentionality and mentorship, how have the things you've done um, prepared you for working in a new health system? You know, you've made a change between, I believe, Presbyterian 
uh, to Mount Sinai, it's still healthcare, but cultures are different, right? So how have the things you've done in your career growth and development aided you in this transition? I think what I recognize early on is that, you know, just like if you're reading a book, you know, it's the book is trying to tell a story and each chapter is different, but the theme remains the same throughout the book. And so what I recognized early is that, you know, the experiences that I was going through at New York Presbyterian and at Columbia um, University, um, because I was faculty there, um, was preparing me for anything in another situation. And, that, and that's another way how we get through things as well. Because if it's something that's challenging, what you're learning is how to navigate through that particular experience. But what's important is to keep your eyes on the prize, if you will, to, to, to remain true and know that the skills I'm learning now is going to help, help me in another scenario. So, you know, I think what prepared me is to always stay focused on, well, I believe that this is going to help me in the end. It wasn't thinking about, well, I'm going to go to some other institution, but I just in order to deal with whatever it is that I was tackling at that moment, I knew that I was gaining a skill set that was going to be helpful for me as I continued to progress throughout my career, whether or not that was a new um, leadership skill set, which I believe leadership skills should be and are transferable, um, no matter which situation you in, you're in or which industry that you're in. So just taking insights from my experiences has prepared me. Um, taking wisdom from my mentors has prepared me for being able to transition into this role as well. I would say believing in myself. I do not suffer from imposter syndrome. Honestly, I don't even recognize imposter syndrome because I firmly believe I'm supposed to be at the table. Um, that this is what I'm supposed to be doing. So you know, I, I feel that I am prepared, just as prepared as anyone else who would be in the position. And if there is anything that I lack, I have the ability to be able to learn it. So um, I'm ready. I always feel like I'm ready. Cut on the camera. Are you ready for me to speak? I'm ready to go. And it's the same scenario here. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, so why don't we stay on that? You talked about uh, leadership skills being transferable. You're all in leadership roles. Can you share what you think are the qualities of a good leader? Can I throw that out to you, Tremaine? I see your lips. I know Tremaine is ready. I saw her. I saw you. <laughs> I saw, um, I got good leadership. Good leadership. I think a strong leader, first of all, can earn trust. I mean, you know, uh, having a title does not mean you're a leader. Um, you need to earn the trust of those that you are leading. They need to be, um, believe in your vision and they need to feel that you're competent to lead. So being able to earn trust, I think is key in being an effective leader, having vision, mm -hmm. um, being flexible, being able to pivot, um, and good leaders create other leaders. I think that's very important. Um, for leaders to not feel insecure or threatened about their positions, um, to always be considerate of secession planning um, and create future leaders. And when I leave Mount Sinai, that will be one of the things I'm most proud of are the leaders that I've created. Yeah, yeah. But I love what you said, right? Um, you're not threatened by others. You just want to empower and build people up but it's also connected to what Dr. Harris said, right? I love the way she said, I don't suffer from imposter syndrome. When, I, when I'm there, I believe I should be there. And there, there's that inherent confidence. So when we have that confidence, it makes us better leaders, right? Because we're less likely to be threatened by others. Anyone else on what the qualities of a good leader uh, would be? Dr. Island, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I'm gonna, <laughs> what do you want uh -huh. on that? So for me, I'm, I'm taking it from a different angle. Certainly, I agree with what's been said, but I think a very important quality is knowing yourself and what's important to you and what you value. 
because without having those things, it's hard to lead because you will be tested. Um, things that you say you value, there will be situations in leadership where those things are um, in conflict with what's going on. Um, if you take a stance on equity, for example, in patient care, um, there will come times when people challenge um, a change in practice that you make in order to ensure equity. But if you and yourself are firm in what you value and what's important, you're not going to waver with those changes. I'm not saying to be inflexible, but I right. think one of the really important characters of being a leader is really self-knowledge and what's important to you and where you draw the line. Wonderful. Thank you so yeah. much. I, I think, you know, to, to add, you know, I think there are several qualities of a great leader. Um, number one, I firmly believe that a leader also has to exercise a bit of humility. Um, mm -hmm. You don't know everything. You know, a great leader surrounds themselves with people, honestly, who are smarter than them, who can challenge them um, and who helps them to think differently. Hence, having a very diverse group around you. So mm -hmm. exercise and humility is very important um, in, in terms of being a great leader. Another point is being agile you know, knowing how to adapt, to adjust to different situations, to not be so set in a certain way. It's important to be, um, to have those uh, characteristics to be a great leader. Thirdly, I would say to listen. You know, it's important to be able to listen to the people who are around you, to hear what they're saying, listening not to react, but listening to respond to what they're saying. And, and I've firmly believe that there is a difference because a lot of times we don't listen. We already have an idea of what we're gonna say. Um, and then lastly, I think a great leader knows how to create the narrative and weave it together into a vision. You have to be able to, to connect the dots for people because you have a, a, you know, a, a lot of people around you and they're trying to figure out why are we on this train? Where are we going? Why are we stopping here? And so it's, it's really important to be able to do that as a leader. Thank you so much. That's wonderful, Dr. Harris. Calandra, specific to you, I know you've done a lot of work in this space, right? You, you mentioned um, the coaching certification that you have. What are key qualities that good leaders, we talked about some great ones, what are key qualities that good leaders miss? Right? What, what's, what's often like, what's, what's in people's blind spots? Sometimes it's the very basics. So again, leadership is not about a title or a position. Leadership, my working definition of leadership is always very simple. It's being yourself. If you know that within your heart and your mind, you are a leader and leader meaning person of influence. So you can be somebody who's not at the top of the food chain and still be a leader because you have influence over others. And a good leader is a good influence. A great leader is a great influence. So sometimes understanding that leadership is just about being you, being yourself and really knowing and going back to what Dr. Island said, you have to know what your values are. You have to revisit what shapes you and what makes you a leader because being agile means that you're gonna be in different situations. You're gonna to have to know just like that, how am I gonna shift gears? But you're gonna to have to do it in a way where you continue to stay true to your values. That's the linchpin that helps you make every other decision going forward. And so if you don't have your own values in check, then you can't do any of those other things that my, my sisters here on the panel have talked about. You cannot establish trust with others. You cannot you know, be confident and, and be humble. You can't do any of those things if you don't know yourself first. So that being bold, being confident, being fearless, those are the things that are helping to shape the values that, that we want to embody as good leaders. Um, the other thing that I think we miss the mark on sometimes is the humility. Um, I'm going to drop another book name. I'm sorry, y'all, but I, I, I'm always reading uh, leadership books. But um, Stacey Abrams' book, Lead from the Outside, really talked about this in her early days, even before she became a politician. But, you know, sometimes we get humility confused. And so just because I am bold and fearless does not mean I'm arrogant. 
and especially as women of color, that is a challenge that we often face is that we want to take that step back because we're afraid of being looked at as the angry black woman. And so what we have to realize is that humility is not always putting ourselves down. Humility is not you know, covering up our lamp so that we don't outshine somebody else or so that we're not mistaken. But one of the things that Stacey Abrams talked about was how when she first got into politics, you know, people would pat her on the back and say, you did a really great job. I mean, people who didn't look like her, people who were of influence and power, who were telling her what a great job she was doing. And she would often just kind of brush it off, you know, like everybody can do that. But what someone, another uh, African-American woman pulled her aside one day and said, stop doing that mm. because that's not humility. That's almost self-deprecation. And there's a difference. So what she explained to her was if somebody in that position is giving you that compliment, they really meant it. And when you diminish the work that you do, others will start to diminish it as well. And so I think that we have to be very careful in what we look at as confidence and 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 not you know, you can be confident and humble at the same time. You can be fearless and fierce and also be humble. Um, but humbling, hum, hum, humility is never taking away from what we are able to do and what we have done. That, that's not humility, all right? That's, that's just being, you know, that's, that's nature. But as long as you don't take away from what we're doing, and I think that's the challenging thing that some leaders miss the mark on is that we take away from our own abilities. Thank you so much, Kalandra. Um, guys, the, the, the chat is alive and well. Uh, someone put in while you were talking, Kalandra, someone said, ouch, all right, in reference to some of the things you were saying. So true. Uh, accept the, thank you, Lindy. Accept the compliments. You deserve them. Absolutely. Thank you for the book. While you were saying it, I put it in the chat this time uh, just to make sure that people were aware of that. Wonderful. All right, so I'm going to move from career growth and development to the topic for today. Uh, which is owning your career, all right? So let's dig a little deeper into this concept of owning your career. I got another quote for you ladies. Alice Walker is quoted as saying, the most common way people give up their power is by thinking they don't have any. Right? Mm -hmm. I've already kind of touched on that this morning in terms of some of the things you've mentioned. So uh, what would you say, well, well, no, let me not start there. What are some specific things you've done on your career journey to own it. Now, you've already alluded to some of it with the first question, but I, what I'm asking you ladies to do is list it out specifically for myself and those participating today. What are the things that you've done that you would say, this is what I did, Maxine, this is what I did attendees to say that I, I did this specifically so that I would make sure that I maintained ownership of my career, my career journey, my trajectory, whatever. Any thoughts? So at the beginning of the year, every year, it, it usually starts, it starts at the end of the year. So at the end of the year, I tend to be very reflective about what I've done, what I've accomplished. And so I start to think about what are my goals for the next year. And I do this every year and I have four different buckets or categories that I develop goals for the year. And I do this in order to continue to improve myself, to set goals for myself, and to move toward my long-term vision. And those categories include professional, spiritual, personal, and financial. And for the, pro the professional goals, I am very specific about what it is that I want to accomplish, whether or not that's specific training that I'm trying to get, whether or not that's pursuing certification, a degree, joining a, a society, whatever it may be, I'm very specific about that. And then I come up with a plan in terms of how to do that. And um, I do check in with myself in the middle of the year to see how I'm progressing with my goals. And by the end of the year, I look back to see what I've done. And for me, that's work because I'm a very organized, structured person. Um, and I'm not saying that I've been able to meet every last one of them every year. Some have carried over, but I've come up with goals for myself um, and really been, as I say, intentional in trying to meet those goals. I mean, even one of my goals, one of my mentors said to me, and I think the women on, on this stage and most women can relate to this, 
she was talking to me about networking and really she didn't use the term networking. She said, building relationships. She said, look, you know when you're gonna get your hair done. You have that on your calendar when you're gonna get your hair done. And for me, it's clockwork. It's every six weeks I get my locks retwisted and washed. And she says, so you should be intentional about who you're going to build a relation with, a, a relationship with, who you're gonna network with. That needs to be on your calendar. So she said, I know for the next six months who I'm gonna have coffee, dinner, you know, a drink with someone who may be on a board with me, someone who's a part of an organization. And I started to do that because that's how the informal way that you get to hear about opportunities. So the point is really being specific about your goals and how you're going to reach them and just being intentional to go after them. Thank you so much, Dr. Harris. Anyone else? And looking back um, at how I owned my career, and you know, I had to grow into it. It wasn't intentional at first. And so when I look back at what I did, the steps that I took, one of the first things I realized I did without putting a name on it was destroying all the fear-based agreements that we had been taught as young children, right? We were taught, oh, you have to work twice as hard just to be as good. And then I get here and realize I'm not as good. I'm twice as good because I worked twice as hard in owning that and feeling okay with that and not diminishing my shine because I earned it. I worked hard for it, right? Mm -hmm. um, other fear-based agreements. I'm too old to go back to school. You know, I had a whole different trajectory, right? I went to FIT for fashion. I was a model. I was gonna take the fashion world by storm. And then I had to pivot because life comes at you and takes you down a different path. And then having to go back to school again as an adult you know, there's a lot of fear around that, taking that first step, signing up for that first class. Um, you know, am I too old to do this? Is my mind still fresh, right? And so once, you, you know, you get on that path, you dispel all those fears and agreements that you made because this is what you've accepted. You know, you got to change that self-talk. And so once I started to do that, I began to see that I can do anything I put my mind to. It's just a decision. And so in owning, you know, my career, it was one, accepting my greatness mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and allowing myself to realize my full potential without putting any limits on myself. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank I, you. I'd like to add, Please, and I yeah. keep coming back to the importance of um, knowing yourself and what's important and doing those check-ins. Um, I have daily meditations, and one of them that I say to myself each morning is something from Martin Luther King Jr., and it simply says, use me, God, show me how to take who I am, who I want to be, and what I can do, and use it for a purpose greater than myself. So Dr. that- Dr. I'm so sorry. Can you say that again? Because that was beautiful. Can you say it one more time, please? Again, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., use me, God. Show me how to take who I am, who I want to be, and what I can do, and use it for a purpose greater than myself. Mm -hmm. And in that statement, although it gives a desire to help others, you is very important, what your skills are and what you want to do. And I use that statement to hold myself accountable. I started this journey in medicine saying that I wanted to impact people in a personal way to be able to help them. And I use that in terms of my professional life. What am I doing to change the lives of those patients I'm impacting? Am I on the right path? Am I setting policies and procedures that take me down that path? Am I doing that with the people in my division? Am I um, you know, helping them to meet their goals? Am I doing that to my community? Am I reaching back into the community to mentor people, um, to bring high school students along to get them closer to their goals? Am I using that in my role as chair of the promotions committee? Am I working with students to bring about a greater good and to impact their lives? So I think, you know, knowing yourself and holding yourself accountable to who you say you are. I'm a person who wants to impact others in a positive way. 
let's make sure, let's check in with yourself and make sure you are holding yourself accountable in meeting that goal. So Dr. Island, I had a question specifically for you. So if you don't mind, cause you're, you're, you're on, you, you've actually started answering it. Um, you changed careers, all right? You mentioned mm -hmm. um, when you made that transition, right? Um, what, what were some of the things you did to give you greater control and ownership? And you might've just answered it, but um, when you decided I'm gonna make this and, and I, you know, I, I applaud you for making that change, were there specific things you said to yourself, well, I'm making a transition from, I believe it was banking uh, to medicine. What are the things I need to do for me, uh, for, for myself, that's gonna give me greater control as I, as I own this journey? Yeah. I think keeping my eye on that goal, what do I want out of life? And certainly I'm reading um, Stacey Abrams' lead from the outside, um, where she talks about framing your career goal, not with a, a title or you know, uh, a certain promotion, but the why of what you do. So keeping that why of I want to personally impact people, that got me through hard times. Um, when I was in investment banking, my job was eight to four. I went home, things were good. I made money, life was great, mm -hmm. but I wanted to impact people. So when I went from a banking salary to I'm a medical student and I'm in debt and I'm a mother and I'm not seeing my kids, I'm not seeing my husband, I'm in the library studying, I am grinding on the wards as an intern the thing that kept me going was looking, having the vision to look out and say, you know what, this is going to lead to what I want to do and who I say I am. If I am going to bring um, an impact to communities, the community that I want to help is, is one that I've come from, people who are not always at the forefront, people who are under-resourced this is the sacrifice I'm going to make because at the end of the day, when I go home from a career, I want to be able to smile at myself and say, you know what, you're doing what you said you wanted to do and you're making the impact. So it's, it's important that you, you know yourself. I, how many times am I going to say that? Because satisfaction, sacrifice, all those things you can keep you know, barreling through, if you know, you know what, I said, this is what I want to do. And I'm doing it. I'm doing it by making the sacrifice and share that with other people who can keep right. you accountable. We talk about peer mentorship being very mm -hmm. important too. People can say, your family can say, you know, times are hard, but you know what, you are making an impact. You are changing, you know, um, the face of what you want to do. And I think that's incredibly important um, and a, a strong motivator. Thank you, Dr. Island. Someone uh, dropped it in the chat. Um, at Lisa, know yourself, say it as many times as you want. You know, you keep saying it, but she's saying, say it as many times as you want because it's, it's, it's fact, it's true and it's wonderful. Thank you so much. I have another question for you guys. What would you say to other women who feel that they do not have the power to own their career trajectory? What would you say to them? Embrace it. Um, I, I, I'm thinking as I'm listening to my 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 co-panelists, I'm putting myself back earlier in my career because there may be some early careerists who are on the on the the webinar. Mm -hmm. And I, I grew up, I was very, very painfully shy. And that that went into my my adulthood. So for much of my career, you know, I was the person that I got good grades, people pat me on the back, you did a great job, you did a great job. Um, we have this position that's available, I want to promote you, you know, that 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 virtual tap on the shoulder. And it got to the point where that wasn't happening anymore, because I was letting my career manage me. And it took someone with fresh eyes to come in and say, Clondra, there's so much more you could be doing. I think sometimes as women, we kind of feel like, well, I got my nose to the grindstone. I know I'm doing a good job. Somebody will see it. But as Dr. Harris said, we have to be an advocate for ourselves. But in all honesty, everybody's not there yet. And there are some people on this call who may feel that I'm not there yet. I still got my head to the grindstone. I'm still trying to figure out who I am so I can know myself. So what I would say to you is when that person came to me and said, Kalanja, you could be X, Y, Z, 
which was like several levels of where I was. And I'm sitting there going, really? I could not own my career until I embraced that. The next stage was I, I, I said to myself, well, I believe he believes that about me. And then I had to, to start believing it about it for myself so that I could be that advocate. And then the next stage was, I don't want to always have to have somebody telling me how great I am or that I'm doing a good job. I want, to, I want that to be self-speak. And I wanna say those things to myself. So for those of you who are sitting there, write down your accomplishments. Write down those, those changes that you've made in your department. Don't underestimate any piece of value that you have added to your daily work life. Because one of the reasons people don't feel that power is because they don't know they have it. Because they've been expressing it and didn't realize that the cape was stuck somewhere in their neck and didn't realize the power that they have. So one of the things we have to make sure that we do is embrace what we're doing and acknowledge it. And that's where we fall short because we never took that step. And also understanding that it is a journey. No one in leadership arrives. We are all still learning. We, you, you heard all these book recommendations. We're all still learning. We're all still growing. And that's how we help other people. So wherever you are in your journey, you have to embrace the power, know that you have it. And some people just don't know they have it. And I think that's one of the things that I'd like to see people take away from this is to realize that you've got, you've got, you've got power. We were born with power that we have not tapped into yet. Black women have been powerful for centuries. We have had to endure, we have been leaders, we have had to be agile. We have had to put our foot down and then pivot and do 10 things at one time and raise children and cook and work and do all these things inherently in our DNA. It is in our DNA to be powerful. We need to embrace that. Thank you so much, Calandra. Ladies, just so you know, I have to mute myself when you're talking because if you could hear what I was saying, you'd laugh. I'm saying go, mm-hmm. I don't want to interrupt you guys while you're speaking because you're dropping so much knowledge right now and it is much, much, much appreciated. Shermaine, I have a specific question for you. Um, you have successfully navigated a long career that has spanned several titles and levels. Were there things, oh, you answered it. Look at that. I like how that happens. Were there things you had to be mindful of that could potentially get in your way? And you said it. You mentioned earlier about what you believed, right? That that talking to yourself. Is there anything else you want to add as I to that to, to the answer to that question? Because I believe that it happened organically. Um, anything else that you did? Well, right. So that's about self limits, right? What limits yeah. that we put on ourselves and being able to dispel any of the uh, fear based agreements that we've made previously. And I'm going to drop a book too, The Four Agreements by Don Miguel Don Miguel Ruiz. Everyone yeah. should read this book. It's so powerful. It's quick. It's a quick read and it will change your life. And I try to live my life by that. So one of the things um, is examining what those agreements that I made, that I subscribe to, that will limit me. And then coming up with a new agreement for myself. So when I started a more positive self-speak, you know, and I believe firmly in um, um, uh, self-fulfilling prophecies, right? If you tell yourself a negative, you're going, all your actions are going to support that negative because then you'll feel that that's what I was supposed to do. And when you change that and make it a positive, all your energy goes toward that positive thought, those positive goals, and you'll make that come to It's the law of attraction. And so one of the things I had to be conscious of though, as um, I, I, you know, worked my way up um, is uh, the barriers that others might put on me, right? Lack of credentials, lack of experience, you know, that whole imposter syndrome thing coming in. Am I good enough to be here in this space? When people tap my shoulder for opportunity, am I ready? Am I good enough? And then very quickly answering, yes, I am. Yes, I am. And then just moving, being bold, being audacious. One of the things I did that was a big, I would say it was the um, uh, denouement of my story, right? The, the pivotal 
turning point is when I went into my boss at the time's um, office and advocated for a job that I had absolutely no experience in, right? I was in administration working behind a desk, um, an opportunity to become the director of operations for an ambulatory practice, a, a very busy, robust practice. But I knew I was confident in my abilities to learn. I'm the type of person that will take something apart and put it back together, and then I own it. And I went in with a list of all my strengths, what I bring to the table. I also listed the opportunity for my growth. These were going to be my learning curves. This is the opportunity here for me, but this is what I expect. And I went in, advocated for myself, and I got the job. And that taught me, one, how to advocate for myself. And that, you know, if you go in with positive, um, uh, positivity and a strong belief in yourself, it's infectious, right? The other person's gonna believe you if you're convincing. But, you know, I went in with stats. I went in with my accomplishment, what, I, what I've done. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was kind of the stepping off piece for me. Um, not only did it show others what I could do, it, it taught me something about myself. That and the fact that I ran four marathons. Once you run one, you will know that you can do anything, anything you ask your mind and your body to do. It's just a decision, a decision about whether you want to, and then if you're able to put the effort behind it. Thank you so much, Tremaine. I have one more question. I am against time, uh, but I see some questions in the chat, um, the question and answer section as well. So. I'm going to try to multitask here a little. Last quote for you guys. Struggle is never and struggle is a never-ending process. Freedom is never really won. You earn it and win it in every generation. Coretta Scott King. You guys have alluded to the answers to this as well, but let me ask anyway. What challenges have you had as a black woman leader, especially in 2021? And how did you overcome them? I'll, I'll throw it out to one of you, and then I'm going to go into the Q&A and see if I can at least answer one of those questions as well. Um, I would say the challenges um, that I have experienced is micro in, invalidation, microaggressions, mm. gaslighting when you raise the issue, um, and how I dealt with it was that I was steadfast in what I know I experience and steadfast in my beliefs and I continue to have the conversation. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I mean, that's one of the things that, I mean, I'm not just gonna say, tw you know, 2020. I mean, this, is, this happens all the time. Um, but, but, but the point is to deal with it, to not let it break you, never let it break your spirit. Um, that's how I've dealt with it, to, to stay firm in what it is that I'm trying to do. Thank you, Dr. Harris. Anyone else? Right. And uh, I found a couple of questions in here. Uh, someone said this discussion is incredibly inspiring. Uh, I'm currently coming from a place of fatigue, uh, COVID, mother of small children, but I can see a future in which I, can, I want to re-engage. Um, what are the costs to deprioritizing leadership development pursuit? Is it okay to kick the can down the road? Are there, or are there ways to do some low key work in the background until I'm ready to go all in? So really great question around the idea of uh, multi, multitasking and understanding what our priorities would be. What are your thoughts on that, Calandra? Um, in terms of, you know, what does someone do in that kind of situation? Do they, do they deprioritize? Do they multitask? What would you say to them? So I don't believe in multitasking. I don't think we are physically capable of really doing real multitasking because then we will not effectively do anything of all the things that we're doing. So um, look for opportunities where you can focus on something. And even if you could bring it into what you're currently doing, you know, sometimes multitasking, you're doing five different things. But if you, you don't multitask, if you can find a way of weaving them all together. Um, I spoke with a mentee the other day who wanted to take a step back and actually do an internship. Again, you have to prioritize and understand what's the return on investment. The, the position that she's gonna step back and take as an intern, once she goes through that process, 
her, her investment is going to be phenomenal. So you have to really just think about what is it that you want to do so that when you're asking yourself these questions, you, you, you answer them based on, is it going to take me to that next level? And that's how you prioritize. So sometimes you, you need to go all in. Sometimes you need to go all in, but you have to just really uh, ask yourself those questions. Where is it going to get me? Is it a worthwhile investment? Wonderful. And someone said, that, yep, absolutely. And one final question, because I want to finish the Q&A, even though I'm up against time. Do you find juggling your career and family to be difficult? Um, anyone can take that. Um, I, I know I can answer. It definitely is. Do you find it to be difficult? But how do you how do you how do you stack up against it? How do you how do you plan against that when when you're up against something that's particularly difficult, like m managing family and work life? Anyone? I put I put effort into the quality since I don't have the quantity of time. Mm -hmm. um, I used to have a lot of guilt around that. You know, I have a 27 year old and I have a seven year old. And seven year old, I feel I'm more absent in her life because I'm busier now. So what I try to do is make sure that when I do have the time, it's something that is um, high quality, something, you know, a, an experience. So we're going to go on vacation and I'm going to, you know, shut everything off and just get down on the floor and connect with you because that's what she's going to remember, right? She's not going to remember the day-to-day -day minutia. She'll remember those experiences. And so I um, try and focus on the quality. Thank you so much, Tremaine. Um, I'm in the chat. I just want to read something that someone said. Such an inspiring webinar. Truly grateful for you amazing ladies. Uh, I would like to thank all the panelists. People have just, they're engaged with us. Wonderful event. Very inspiring. So I wanted to read a couple of those comments. We're at 12 o'clock. So I do want to be considerate of everyone's time. Ladies, I want to thank you for today. Uh, this has been truly wonderful. I'm going to ask, I'm going to take a chance and ask you to do one more thing for me. Give me one word you want to leave or two words that you want to leave with everyone who attended today anything in power i know i heard the word i heard the values i heard agile i heard i heard um uh, i don't have imposter syndrome or things like that if you could leave one thought with the attendees today what would you want them to know Calandra, i'm starting with you use your power thank you Tremaine. authenticity excellent dr harris be intentional Wonderful. Dr. Island. The power of you and knowing yourself. All right. This has been wonderful. Thank you, ladies, so much. I'm looking forward to doing this again. I want to thank once again, Lindia. I want to thank Pam Abner, all right, who uh, is leading our, our Black Women's ERG. She's our VP for Chief Diversity. So let's give her a hand clap. Pam has just been a tremendous leader in this work. I want to thank our panelists uh, for being a part of this. And I want to thank our attendees. You guys, your engagement this morning in the chat, the, 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 the thirst for knowledge, the wanting the name of the books, it is just overwhelming. Uh, this has been one of, actually one of the best panels I've ever had the privilege of moderating. So thanks again, everyone. Happy Friday and be safe. We'll see all of you guys later. Take care. Thank everyone. you, Maxine. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.